This video is going to be an introduction to R. We're going to learn how to load packages, assign objects, create vectors and data frames, and then generate some basic plot types. If you ever had a chance to look at Hadley's caveat, we're going to do that right now. But before we begin, I, I kind of want to start with it, the caveat. And, and the bad news is whenever you're learning a new tool, for a long time you're going to suck. It's going to be very frustrating. Uh, but the good news is that that is typical, it's something that happens to everyone, and it's only temporary. Unfortunately, there is no way to going from knowing nothing about the subject to going knowing something about a subject and being an expert in it without going through a period of uh, great frustration and uh, much suckiness. But remember, when you're getting frustrated, that's a good thing, that's typical, it's temporary. Keep pushing through, and then time will become second nature. Hadley is also the author of the book that we're using. Uh, for part of this class, the online book that is around R and data science. Um, he's the, a number, an author of a number of the packages that we'll be using and um, just a really respected data scientist and member of the data science community. And this is a model that was created by Hadley and it is a model for um, researchers, statisticians, data scientists and the basic model is this. You import your data in some way into R, you tidy it up, you know, cleaning up variables or getting rid of missing data or, or addressing missing data, and then you enter into a, uh, an area of understanding, and this is a recursive loop. Uh, typically, you start with transforming. This could be uh, summarizing into um, like something like crosstabs, for instance. You're summarizing your data, though, in some way, or you're adding uh, additional variables to it. You're transforming and maybe you're reshaping your data, and th from there, you typically visualize the data, and then you make a model of your data, and you, this is a recursive loop going back and forth. And this helps you to understand what's going on in your data and to build a model that will generalize. And from there, you typically then communicate your results to someone else, typically in a written format or a presentation. And we're going to start our, our journey with R at, at the visualization step. And it might seem funny. You might think, well, why wouldn't you start with import? And, and, and I started um, writing the slides in that fashion. But then I got thinking, and I wrote about this a bit in the syllabus, I got thinking about my journey with learning to play guitar when I was younger. And, and starting out with some book that had me playing Tom Dooley and Scales and how boring and just unmotivating that that is. And I felt like, you know, th that's doing the same thing um, with statistics and understanding data when you start with things like low-level importing and, and all the theory and tools and, and start building up. And it's, it's really unmotivating. And I think that um, it's, it's quite a bit more motivating to start with visualization, something that's really quite useful in, in seeing, wow, this is what this tool is capable of. And then from there, in a just-in-time fashion, um, adding in the theory and the tooling that you need um, to be able to um, complete an analysis from end to end. So this is the model that we'll be using throughout this course. And these are the tools that help us with this modeling. Um, we will not be doing anything with SQL Ops in this particular course, but typically data will come to a data scientist uh, through SQL. Uh, for a researcher, it will come through uh, CSV files often. Um, not always, but these are your typical avenues. Uh, the tooling we're going to be working with in this course are the um, tools here. These are add-on packages written by Hadley Wickham for R, starting with Read R all the way up to ggplot2. And again, we're going to be starting with the ggplot2 package today. So let's dig in and let's uh, get some coding done, okay? I'm going to show you how to uh, have basic workflow. So you'll download the folder for each session, and inside of that will be a .rproj. If your system doesn't allow you to see hidden files, uh, you may have to turn this on. Um, I've ha often had problems, particularly with Mac OS's, and being able to see this .r project. But this is a really nice file. When you click on it, it automatically will open up an RStudio session for you. RStudio, again, is a wrapper for R, a nice GUI graphical user interface for R. Okay. And typically, when you open it up, you'll see a bunch of different files. Over here on the right, you'll see a console window here. And we can treat R like a calculator. And it's very basic. It's a calculator. So you could enter in like 2 plus 5 and return something back to you. Or we can do 6 times 5. We can do division 5 slash 3. Um, we can do raising things to power. So 4 raised to the second power should give us 16. We can also do square roots. We use powers there as well. So we can do 25 raised to the 1 half power will give us the square root of 25, which is 5. Okay, so we can use it as a calculator. I encourage you to, to pause the video here and play around a little bit um, using some basic operators, arithmetic operators there. Now, R isn't particularly useful, and most programming languages are not to just enter stuff into the command line. Uh, typically, we want to operate out of scripts, and you can open up a script, a new script in R, by going File, New File, R Script. 
Um, inside of the, the projects we have, you also have files with scripts in them, and they will be uh, have a suffix on the end of .r, and those are R files or R scripts. And we can see over here on the right-hand side are files, intro to R script, and you should all have that. And this is typically how we operate out of R, and the reason is you can save it. You can um, cut and paste code um, from different places, Stack Overflow, for instance. Um, you can share scripts this way. You can reuse a script for another analysis. So it's pretty nice in that fashion over um, systems like SPSS, where you're manually having to click a process. And here's how you use a script. So again, you can type things like 3 plus 5 and treat it like a calculator. And to make this script text go up into the console, we can do a couple ways. We can highlight it like I just did, and then click the Run button. And you can see it, it in the console return that value of 8. Another way is to highlight it and click Control Enter. On a Mac, I believe it's Command Enter. And that's typically how I operate. It's a little faster than having to click. They sometimes call a mouse a rat-tailed beast. Uh, R Studio is actually pretty smart as well, and you don't actually have to highlight the line. You can just be on the line you want to be on with your cursor right here. I'm hitting Control Enter, and you can see it sent it to the command line. So that's typically how you operate from a script, and then you can save that and rerun that in another session. Um, we can do 2 divided by 4, run it, and you can see it goes to the console. And if you want to get rid of what's in the console, uh, you can hit Control L, and it will get rid of what's in the console and give you some fresh real estate. Next thing we're going to do is to install a package. And to do that, you use the install packages command. And then you type the package you want to uh, install with quotes inside of parentheses like this. Okay, And we're going to install the DevTools package. And you can see it's doing some stuff up here. There's a stop sign. Um, and now our cursor is back here. We know that that command is done. Go ahead and do the same thing for um, installing tidyverse and the hexbin packages. Okay, You've now typed that out. And you can go ahead and you see I'm running multiple lines of code at once. I highlighted them all. Hit Control Enter or Run. And you can see that it's installing tidyverse and the hexbin packages. Tidyverse might take you a little bit longer if it's the uh, first time you've really used R because it relies on a number of um, other packages. Okay, So the first time you, you need to get a package, you need to install it. And you have to only do that once unless you need to update that package. And you should only have to do that once. But when you actually use a package for the first time in a session, every time you start a new session, you need to load it. So there's the install and now the load. And to load it, use library and the name of the package, and it doesn't have to be quoted. And we turned our cursor, so it just loaded the DevTools package. Go ahead and pause the video and load the Tidyverse package as well. Okay, You can load both of those packages. You can see the Tidyverse actually spat out some information when it was loaded up. Okay, So we've just covered how to install add-on packages for R. So base R is pretty useful, but there are over 10,000 additional add-on packages that can be used with um, R to improve its power. A lot of uh, cutting-edge statistical methods are written and placed on a uh, CRAN repository, and you can download those packages and use those cutting-edge mathematical techniques. Now, it's typically not that useful just to operate out of a script. We oftentimes want to take variables and pass them around, right? So it'd be nice if we could say, this thing is equal to this and be able to pass it to something else. This is really the heart of programming. And I'll show you what I mean by this. So we can take an object, we'll name it X, I'm just randomly choosing the name X, and we're gonna make the assignment operator, that is the less than sign with a dash, and we're going to assign a value to it. We're going to assign the number 3. And this isn't quite how it works in R, but conceptually it's easy to think of it like this. You have the X, and you want to assign 3 to it. right? So we're going to run that to the command line. And you can see over here on the right-hand side, we now have a global variable of X, and it's equal to 3. And you can type that into the command line, and it returns 3. Or you can come down here, highlight X, and run it to the command line, and it returns 3. So we have a variable that we can pass around. That's pretty useful, right? And with our naming, we can name these objects really whatever we want. There are some restrictions. My recommendation is to stick with letters and underscores. Uh, you won't have problems that way. So let's do another variable. Let's call something x, and we're going to assign to it a string. And to do strings, we use quotes, either single or double quotes, right? And we can call it whatever we want. You can call it your name, whatever you want, and you just run that to the console. And you can see now we have in the global environment a y variable called hello world. One is numeric, and one is a string variable, right? So this is pretty useful. But we can make it even more useful. We can start combining them together, and we can put them into a vector. And a vector really is just a container where you can put like things. And we're going to start with making a numeric vector, and we're going to call it numvec. We'll assign it to the numvec 
object. And to make a vector, you use C as a function. See that I use parentheses there. And we can put numbers in there. So 23, we can do 3 divided by 7. Whatever you want to put in there, that's a number. 7 raised to the fourth power. Um, we can use missing values. That's an NA. Notice that I didn't use any quotes. And you can then go ahead and run that. And you can see you have a numvec object. And we can see what that looks like. Return it in the command line. And we can see that they're all numbers, right? And we have one missing value here. We can also create character vectors in the same exact way. And the nice thing about R, by the way, is you can cut and paste code and reuse it. So we just call this charvect. Instead of uh, character or numbers, we can use characters. Remember that they have to be strings. Fast, car, hello. We can even use that variable from up above. Remember when we had hello world? It's a character. We can grab Y and put it in there. Notice that I don't use quotes on the Y. We can use a missing value in there if we want. And let's see what happens also if we put a number in there. And we run that. And we can see it actually ran. There's no error. And let's see what charvec looks like when we return it in the console. We can see everything returns as we expected it. That number was coerced to the least restrictive uh, type, which is character. So the 5 became a character. You can tell that because it's quoted. Notice the NA is a missing value. No quotes. Okay. Now we can go a step further and start binding these numeric and character and all other types of vectors together. But here we're just learning about numeric and character, right? And we can bind them together into a tabular format called a data frame. And the tidyverse package uh, has a data frame type. And to let's go ahead and call that dat. And to make a data frame, use data underscore frame as the function. And we can put inside, think of that as a container that holds vectors of equal length. And we can put a vector, we'll name it. We name it by saying some sort of name, just like we did with assignments up here. But instead of the assignment operator, we use an equal sign, right? And we use the vector as a C, remember, function. And let's make this numeric. So let's do 23, 4, and A. Let's make a, we're going to put a comma after, to separate each of these vectors. We can do a Y vector. Let's make that character. We'll just grab three values here. Dump them inside. Let's see what that looks like. So we can assign that, or we can just bring our cursor up here to data frame and run it, and it will return to the console. And it's as we expect. The first one, X, is a double or a numeric uh, column, and the second column is character, and there's missing values for the third element on each of those, the third row or observation. We can go further, and here we're going to make an integer column. And one really nice way to make a sequence of integers in R is with a colon operator. And I'm going to take 23, 24, and 25. And to do that, we do 23, colon, 25. I'll show you what that looks like in the console. And you see it returns a, a series, a run, from 23 to 25. Notice in our data frame that all of the columns have the same number of elements. Let's go ahead and sign that to dat and look at it. And we can see that it comes out as expected. So this is the heart of a lot of um, modeling in R is a, a data frame. And the next thing we're going to look at is viewing that data. And the view function is really quite useful. The capital view, capital V that is, remember the R is case sensitive and you wrap dat around that we're going to send that to command line you can see that it returns something that looks like uh, something we might see in Excel and you can do filtering on that you can do sorting so it, it's it's actually pretty useful uh, rudimentary but pretty can be pretty useful and it's a nice way to see larger data sets versus sending it to the command line and another way we can do that if we've created the variables ourselves um, you can come up here into the global environment and I'm actually going to X out of that so we can see what happens you can come up to the global environment, click DAT, and it does the same exact thing. It's really running view in the back end, and you don't see that. Okay? If the data set comes from a package, you won't be able to click up in the global environment. You'll actually have to run it by wrapping it with view. Okay? Now we're going to install some uh, uh, package from GitHub, and we're not going to talk about this too much. We're just going to run these two lines of code. And what that does is install a, pa a Carnegie data set for Carnegie classic classifications for higher ed institutions uh, from my GitHub account. All right, now that you've installed that, remember you have to load it with the library function. I'd encourage you to pause the video here and to try to do that on your own. Here I have wrapped Carnegie package with library and I run that. And it loads the Carnegie data set, or the Carnegie package. Inside of this Carnegie package, I actually have um, a data set called Carnegie as well. And we can view that data set 
by sending it to the console. And we see, wow, it's actually pretty huge. In fact, it's so large, it wraps around and only gives us the column names, right? So that view function is a really nice place to use it, and we get to see the data set in a nicer, na more natural way. And we can see that we can scroll over, we can scroll down, and view it more like we would view something in Excel. And if a data set or a function comes with a package, you should be able to get help on it. And to get help, you type question mark and then the data set name or the function name, and you run that to the console. Or you can type it directly into the console. And you see here that a window, a help window, popped up on the right-hand side describing the data set, talks about the different variables, what they mean, uh, the size of the data set that it has a little over um, 4,500 rows and 36 variables. We can actually pop that window out if we want. Okay, that's a nice way to get help. One caveat, though, with help, Let's say we were wanted help on the plus operator. We type question mark plus. And notice that there's a plus sign here. That's because it never closed out. It never ran. And this is because we have some reserve symbols in R. And a plus sign is one of those reserve symbols, right? So if we try to get help on something with reserve symbols, uh, if you have something, for instance, with a space in it, that would be reserved. Um, there's a number of other different reserved um, characters as well. If you have a problem where it's not closing out, what you need to do is to wrap it with tick marks. So we can do question mark, back tick, plus back tick, we run it. And now we get a help file for arithmetic operators. We could have actually wrapped Carnegie with the back ticks as well. That would work, but it's unnecessary. But for the plus sign, it was necessary because it's a reserved character. Now let's get into plotting a little bit. And here we're going to be using the ggplot package. And let's go back to slides for just a, a moment. And ggplot works like this. It takes some data set, and given a set of these grammar or rules, uh, you should be able to express the data in any way that your heart desires, well, within reason, something that's reasonable and follows theory, right? So you can take this small data set and represent it in any of these different ways right here, okay? So that's the idea behind the grammar of graphics is infinite expression, or at least um, low restrictions on the way you express yourself. So let's dive into what I mean by this a little more. So Excel has preset choices in their graphics. There's no grammar behind it. So if you have a data set, you go ahead, you highlight it, you click on uh, something with a chart in the uh, ribbon above, and it allows you to choose from a select number of um, visualizations. And there's actually quite a few in Excel, but you're kind of limited. You're limited by what that developer, that programmer thought of or was willing to program or that company was willing to program in there. So you're restricted by the available plots, right? Whereas a grammar isn't restricted in the same way. You might have restrictions, but not as restricted. Let's push on that a little more. So Excel works like this. You have data, you select a plot type, you style it a little bit, and then you wind up with a visual. Um, ggplot is a grammar of graphics. That's what the GG stands for. And it starts with data. You have geomes that represent that data, or your maps to the data. And you have aesthetics that can also map to data. And you can facet, and you have coordinate systems, scales, themes, and you produce a visual. And if you don't know what those mean right now, that's fine. Okay? But realize there's a whole grammar behind ggplot, uh, whereas in Excel you're picking static graphs, right? So think about it a little more like this. If someone were learning English, you might say to them, hey, learn these 20 sentences. These are really, really quite useful sentences for getting around and, and interacting with people. And that, that's good advice, right? Um, excuse me, I'm sorry, what do you think? These are pretty useful uh, sentences, right? That's how Excel works. It has a number of built-in things that someone else thought were really pretty useful. And they, they typically are, right? But if you then this English speaker wanted to uh, um, share their love for someone, something complex and, and complicated like sharing your love, and they wanted to write a beautiful love sonnet, it's highly unlikely that you could write a, a beautiful love sonnet with these pre-configured 20 sentences, right? So you're not free to express yourself in the way that you might want to with Excel. Whereas ggplot, on the other hand, is a grammar. It's a system of rules. And it allows you to express yourself in infinite ways and create beautiful love sonnets, uh, well, beautiful visualizations in this case. So that's what a grammar of graphics does versus a, a set of preset plots that are available. So let's get back into coding a little bit. So we're going to start by loading the ggplot package. It's actually already loaded because it's part of the tidyverse package, but this gives us good practice with loading a library. And the first thing we're going to look at is boilerplate for the ggplot um, functions to create uh, visualizations. And it, they basically all have the same boilerplate. You start with ggplot, you can put data here inside of ggplot, or you can put it inside of the geome, okay? Here you have the geome function that can change. The data changes. 
and then the mapping, the aesthetic mapping changes. So you have aesthetics for the geome that maps to the data. So I've said a couple things. I've said geome and aesthetic. And you might be asking, well, what is a geome? What is an aesthetic? So we're going to talk a little bit about that for a second here. So what are, what are, are these geomes and aesthetics and how do they map to data? So let's think of it like this. Here on the left-hand side, we have a table, um, tabular data. And here we have geomes right next to it. These geomes happen to be points, and you can map data values to these geomes. You can map position. These could be x and y variables. Maybe you have um, something like salary and age, and you can map those to x and y. Um, we also see other aesthetics about the points. We see coloring here that's probably being mapped to the a variable, and that maybe that's talking about a, another numeric variable. Maybe that's talking about uh, how fast you drive. And then we see size of the geome. That's another aesthetic of the geome, and that's mapped to B. That's probably numeric as well, uh, and maybe that's uh, another um, numeric variable. Maybe that's number of children, something like that, right? So you can map your data to um, the geomes and the aesthetics of those geomes, and you put that onto a coordinate system, and you wind up with a plot. So this is how the underlying grammar works. You take, fundamentally, you take data, you map it to geomes, and you map it to aesthetics of those geomes, and you develop a plot. And this is the ggplot cheat sheet, and you can see there's lots and lots of geomes. There's actually even more geomes available in ggplot, and even more with the add-on packages. But the dirty little secret of visualization is most everything can be done quite efficiently and quite effectively with these four geomes. And we're going to talk a bit about those four geomes. I do want to make the caveat that without an aesthetic, geomes are nothing. And to make that point, here is a point. Do you see the point? You don't. And the reason you don't is because there's no aesthetic value attached to it. You can't perceive it. It's just a point in space. Let's go ahead and add color to it. Now you can perceive it. That's an aesthetic of the point, the color that is. Here's some other aesthetics. And these can all be mapped back to data. They don't have to be, but these aesthetics can be mapped back to data and represent the data in some way and allow you to gain insight from your data. So again, back to that mapping, you map um, the data to geomes and aesthetics of those geomes. And this is called mapping. But you can also use constant values for aesthetics. So here on the right-hand side, you can see that I have mapped um, the color to blue. And this is just a constant value. It doesn't hold any meaning. It's just something I did it to make the graph look a certain way, and I wanted it blue. Okay, So it doesn't hold any meaning that maps to a variable in the data. Here's another type of um, plot. This is called a Gantt plot, and it's created by taking bars and mapping it to um, beginning and ends. This would make sense for start and stop times, for instance. Um, and then we've also mapped the, the color to a variable as well. And then the Y is a variable that looks like people. Okay, so let's code a little bit more. So let's start with um, bars. We're going to grab that boilerplate from up above. And it says, let's start by looking at the distribution of states. And we know that we're going to need geom bar. And we know our data set is Carnegie. And we're going to map it to the distributions of states. And that would be state abbreviation, I believe. And i gotta, I got to view that again. This is an actual real data set, so I didn't have a choice over the names. Looks like stab BR, all caps. And this is x equals. And we run that, and we can see that it created a bar plot. It might not be the best bar plot in the world, um, but it did create a bar plot. And look at how I'm increasing my real estate here, so you can see it a little better. And we can see, oh, California has the most institutions. Um, New York has a number. Pennsylvania has quite a few. Texas, um, Florida, Ohio. This is not surprising. And notice that we passed only one value in. Um, that was state abbreviations from the data set. And what's happening on the fly is... Geom bar is using a, an underlying st stat, and that stat is count to count up the y value or the number in each of these um, counts. And we can actually look at the source code for geom bar, put it right into the console, and we can see the source code. And we can see right here the default is stat count. And you can override this default, and we're going to in the future. We can override this default, and we can actually pass in a y value as well. Okay? Let's grab that same exact code, and this is again the nice thing about scripts we can cut and paste. It says, go ahead and look at the locale distribution as well. Give ourselves a little more real estate. And you can see that most institutions are found in large cities and large suburbs. Over here in the middle. 
And that's really not surprising. Next, it asks for looking at the IP grad 2015. And if you don't remember what IP grad means, remember you can use question mark, look at the help file, and IP grad, come down, it says graduate institution classification, research, doctoral, STEM dominant. Okay, so we get an idea. Let's go ahead and run that. And wow, the, the names for this are pretty uh, compact. We really can't read that. So a nice little trick is to flip the coordinates around. We just chain on to the end here with a plus sign, coordinate flip. And this uh, alters the coordinate system for ggplot, part of the grammar. And we can see it's rotated it now, and the x and the y are flipped. And we can see the longer um, axis labels now, and it's a lot easier to read. Now let's move on to points. And points are really useful for looking at bivariate relationships like correlation. Instead of geom bar, we use geom point. Keep data the same, and we're looking at two variables here. It asks us to look at SAT verbal and SAT math. And we can intuit that we'll need an X and a Y for this. And notice everything is happening inside of this AES. That's when we want to map data to, uh, or map an aesthetic to a variable, we use the AES. If we want a constant value for something, we do it outside, and I'll show you that in a moment. Let's go ahead and map that, and we can see, okay, this is a pretty tight correlation. But up here in the console, some things might cause you to be wary. So we see, wow, 3,200 some rows were removed, and that's because there was a missing value in either the verbal or the mathematics or both for that student. So that many rows were removed, and that's out of uh, 4,600 rows. So there's roughly 1,400 rows left, and that gives me a second thing that, that might be concerning. I look at the points over here, and I see, oh, wow, there's uh, probably not 1,400 points there. And the reason is we're dealing with overplotting. And when you have um, integer values like this, or a massive amount of data, it tends to plot on top of itself and it, um, obscures how many points are in the same position, right? So we can deal with that in a couple different ways. Actually, multiple different ways. I'll show you a few here. One, we can change the transparency of the, the dots or the points by setting the alpha level. And alpha is a value between 0 and 1, 1 being perfectly opaque and 0 being perfectly transparent. We'll do like a 0.2. And I'm going to run that code. And notice that it's this is a, an aesthetic. But I'm mapping it to a constant of 0.2. It's not being mapped to any sort of data. So it goes outside of AES because it's not being mapped to a, anything in the data. And we run that, and we can see a little bit more. We can see some more density happening down here. Um, but maybe there's a better way to, to view what's going on. There is. We're going to cut and paste that same code. And instead of geom point, we're going to use geom jitter. And geom jitter is pretty nice. It's a, it's a point with a slight amount of noise or variation added in. And you might say, wow, we're adding random noise to the data. That sounds not good. But sometimes it can actually help you to see what's going on. Random noise is often used in a lot of different methods. So you can specify how much jitter you want, and I would recommend always doing that. You can say how much you want width-wise, and I'm going to choose 10. And then you can specify how much you want height-wise, and I'm again going to choose 10. And the reason I'm choosing 10 is because that's a pretty small amount. Look at the scale. We're going from like 200 up to like 800 or something like that. 10 is not going to, uh, you know, it'll it'll make the point so they're not overlapping, but it's not going to add so much noise that, hey, we can't even make sense of this anymore. So let's go ahead and run that to the console, and you can start to see, yeah, that did help quite a bit. Just that little bit of random noise helped us to see things in a, a little nicer light when we're dealing with overplotting. Uh, another way we can handle overplotting is with um, tiling. So we're going to use geombin 2D, and there is no alpha or width or height arguments. So we're going to delete those, but everything else is the same. We can run that, and we see that it creates um, tiles or boxes that are filled in depending on how many how much data is in that particular location. We can do the same thing with another geom that's very similar called geom hex. Maybe there's a little more aesthetically pleasing. And we can see that it uses hexes instead of uh, squares. Okay. So I'd like you on your own to try uh, looking at the same type of relationships using one of these methods up here, uh, whatever you find to be most useful, and look at it for the variables fall enrollment for 13, fall enrollment for 14. See how they relate. And also do the same type of procedure looking at the relationship between number of rooms and the SAT verbal scores and see if you can find a relationship. Okay. I also noticed um, that I had in the notes here to try rooms versus full enrollment 14. If you didn't do that, that's okay. 
but we can see here where we plotted full enrollment 13 for, against 14. We'd see almost a perfectly linear relationship. We'd expect that. A couple things though we do want to pay attention to. Um, we see that the scale goes out quite far to like 200,000. We see particularly one point here where it, it's uh, definitely something going on. It's um, for 13 it had almost zero, and then in 14 it's got nearly 200,000. So what's going on there? Some, something doesn't seem right. We see some extreme values here at the right hand side and up quite a bit near the 100,000 range. Something something needs to be inspected a little more closely there. They're outside of the typical values to see if there are there mistakes in data entry, what's going on there. Um, was this in, this uh, one here near 200,000, was, was that an institution, like an online MOOC or something that got added and it's a huge institution and it was added from 13 to 14, okay? Next plot we're gonna look at is uh, rooms versus SAT verbal 25 and we really don't see much of, of any sort of pattern at least the eye doesn't detect much maybe a slightly upward trend but there's a lot of variability going on here looks more like a cloud to me okay so we're gonna move on to boxes and let's grab something for boilerplate from up here and in particular one of the most useful types of boxes are box plots the tile we did up above the with the geom um, bin 2d that was a type of tile but here we're using box plot. Is that where I mean it's a type of box. Box plot is also a type of box, probably the most common one. And I'm going to get rid of alpha and width and height. And it's asking for the combined math and verbal scores for y. Box plot does require an x and y var value. The x is typically a grouping variable. Here I'm going to set that to uh, a default of 1. And that's just so I can create a single box plot. Um, and just look at the distribution for SAT combined 25. Typically, this is not the way you use box plot. You usually want to use several box plots together, but for demonstration purposes, I'm going to run that code. And we can see, yeah, indeed, there is a single box plot. It looks pretty normally distributed. Uh, I can tell that because the two sides of the box split by the center dark line are fairly even. I mean, we might see a slight um, right-hand skew, but pretty pretty normal distribution. Okay. Now, box plots get more useful when you can start comparing on a grouping variable. And the next part has us do this, has us look at IC level. So instead of X equals one, we're gonna type X equals IC level. And you can see that for four or more years, the SAT scores have a much um, higher in, um, distribution. You can see the median score for four or more years compared to at least two, but less than four years. We can see that the median value is about the 75th percentile for the at least two, but four years. So Overall, generally, four or more year students um, have higher SAT scores. So that's interesting. Probably not surprising, but interesting. And it asks us to do the same um, thing looking at combined SAT scores for control groups. So pause the video and go ahead and do that on your own. And you should have a box plot that looks something like this comparing private for pro profit, private non for profit, and public. And a box plot is a summary of data. I want you to keep that warning in mind, and that warning will come to roost in a few moments here. But we can see going off just this box plot that, wow, private for-profit institutions have a much lower median SAT score. It's a very skewed distribution. Um, we can see that the 75th percentile for private for-profits is at about the 50, 50th percentile for private non-for-profits. So this private for-profit group is quite a bit less than the other uh, two groups. And we, in a little bit, we'll talk about, or I will show, um, why just going off the boxes alone can be dangerous because it's a summarization. Anytime you summarize data into very specific um, numbers, you may miss some of the nuance of the data, or you might not understand what's happening in the data. Okay. Next, we're going to look at lines, and there is a geom line, but for this particular um, session, we're just going to use a geom smooth, which was a type of or a way to re plot a regression summary line. Okay, and we're going to do that for rooms versus SAT. Um, verbal 25. In fact, I tell you what, we do the same relationship above, up above with points. I'm going to just go ahead and grab that code chunk. It's a nice thing about um, scripting. You can reuse code chunks. I'm just going to replot that to help us remember what that looks like. Now I'm going to grab that same code chunk. I'm going to put it down below and I'm going to comment out that code chunk above and I'm going to change it to geom smooth. And this is going to plot a regression line. I'm going to get rid of alpha and width. That's not parameters of GeomSmooth. 
and we can see that it's going to plot a regression line. And this is a smooth regression line, something like a lowest curve or something like this. And the gray area shows the variability in the data. So further out to the right here, we can see the data becomes much more variable than down um, on the left-hand side here. And so this is a, a line that can be used to represent our data. And that's somewhat interesting. But the real power of ggplot comes in when you start combining these different plot types. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that code chunk. I'm going to uncomment the geom jitter. I'm going to uh, plot the raw data. And then on top of it, I'm going to plot a smooth regression curve. Or not. I did not chain it together. I'm going to put a plus sign after it. And that chains ggplot commands together. And there we see um, both geoms laid on top of each other. And you can combine geoms and, and make really very complex uh, visualizations in this fashion. So I think it would be useful right now to play around with this data set, play around with some of the geomes we've used, and go ahead and create some layered graphs for yourself. Uh, you can add two. I would challenge yourself to start with adding two geomes, and if you want to move beyond two geomes, go ahead and try that as well. Here you can see what I've created. I've used the box plot that we had before when I said, hey, there's something we need to, to look at a little more closely here. I went ahead and took the raw data, the points. I jittered them underneath, and then I plotted the box plots on top of them. And you can see that I only... I did not jitter the height, because there's no need here to jitter the height, but I jittered the width. So that allows us to see what's going on with the raw data. And when we do this, we see something for the private for-profit. Wow, there's only a few data points attached to it. So to make um, assumptions or generalizations about this data is really pretty dangerous because we're not that confident in it. There's just not enough data points to say much about private for-profits as compared to the other two groups. One last thing I want to talk about is um, setting data and setting aesthetics globally. So we had this uh, code chunk up above where we uh, plotted geom jitter with geom smooth, right? And you notice there's quite a bit of um, redundancy in the code. We have data equals Carnegie twice. And if you want, you can remove some of that redundancy. So sometimes you want a different data set for every single geom, and you want different aesthetics for every geom. If that's what you want, very specific, very controlled, great, use that. But sometimes you do have just one data set and you have uh, the same aesthetic for lots of geomes and you want to set it once instead of writing it multiple times. If that's the case, you can set it globally. And to do that, you just put it into the ggplot command up here. So we type data equals Carnegie and I'm going to go ahead and delete that out from the geomes. I'm going to run it. You can see, oh, it went ahead and plotted the same exact thing. Maybe a little bit different jitter, but because um, jitter is random. And we can do the same thing with aesthetic, because it's the same aesthetic over and over again. You can put it up here globally and set it once globally, delete it out of the geomes down below. And this makes the code a little bit more readable, a little bit more maintainable, and uh, easier to, to reason about when this makes sense, when you actually have the same data set for all geomes. I'm going to go ahead and run that, and we can see, okay, oh, it just plots exactly as we had expected it to. So this has been the first lesson on uh, using R. We've learned how to load packages, how to view data, how to plot some data.